because America will not tolerate anyone opting out of her system. America is an imperialistic country, and the first object of its imperialism was the conquest of the South and the subjugation of the South uh, and the continuous looting of the South, which went on for generations through things that are not ever written in history books, such as the discriminatory rate system on railroads, which was a deliberate policy pursued for four generations to prevent us from being industrialized. Southern factories were made to pay vastly higher costs to ship their products than northern owned factories. We were kept as an agrarian colony of the American empire by federal will. Uh, so much for the alleged charitable feelings that we are told those people had toward black people uh, because they too were barred from the benefits of industrialization. The resistance was flawed from the very beginning and this is shown in the slogan that emerged and that slogan was heritage not hate, uh, which we have heard thousands of times in the last 20 or 30 years. This is a catastrophic slogan. It is a fatal slogan. It is fatal because it accepts the regime's paradigm. It accepts the idea that things like uh, slavery, uh, the secession, the Civil War, opposition to Reconstruction, uh, the devising of the system of segregation as a means of preserving the racial integrity uh, of Southern white people, resistance to the Civil Rights Bill, all of these are admitted to be hate by the slogan, heritage not hate. And, and of course, it's then fatally defective. If that's your heritage, why do you care about it? it it's like saying that your great-grandfather was Jack the Ripper. Why, why would you want to honor that heritage? You'd want to, to find something else to honor. So it played right into the hands uh, of our enemies. And this slogan was rooted in the deep desire that Southerners have to be accepted, to be real Americans, and to sit down. They, these flaggers, the people who defended the flag, we'll call them flaggers, had a deep desire to sit down at Dr. King's uh, table of brotherhood, a table of brotherhood that has never existed in human history and never will exist, uh, that they desire to be accepted, to be accepted as good Americans and to be accepted to sit down at Dr. King's table. The, there was failure to follow a fundamental law which I, I have applied in my life with great success, whether in investments, a family, uh, personal problems, political issues, and it's an, a maxim I urge you to consider incorporating into your psychology. And that maxim is this, before there is something to do, there is something to know. And that is what this conference today represents. It represents obedience to this maxim that before there is something to do, there is something to know. The people who rushed forward to defend the flag did so, uh, they, they went off half cocked. They, they did not think through what needed to be done, what needed to be said. They did not have themselves the pr necessary preparation to really defend the South because they had accepted the paradigm of being Americans. Southerners tenaciously have embraced uh, the American identity. I, I was virtually ordered out of my beloved cousin's house in Charleston uh, when I opposed the war in Iraq. Uh, and she had her federal flag out in front of her house and her support the troops bumper saying She's a wonderful woman. She's like a sister to me. But she comes from people who have suffered more than any other group in America from American imperialism. In the city of Charleston, for Pete's sakes, she, she is desperate to be accepted as an American. You even hear in the South, this little joke, Southerners love it, that the Civil War was when the North invaded America. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny, but it's also tragic. No, that's not what the Civil War was. 
The Civil War was when the American Empire invaded us, uh, and when they crushed us, uh, when they crushed the South, crushed it, they crushed it cruelly, brutally, ruthlessly, and systematically, and they have kept it crushed for generations. It was only in the emergency of World War II that the federal government abandoned the policy uh, of discriminatory freight rates. Uh, Adolf was at the door and, and wanted to talk, and they finally were scared enough uh, in the 1940s to allow Southerners to begin to experience economic prosperity. The paradigm of our enemies excludes white Southerners. It requires our extinction, as it requires the extinction of anybody who resists, anybody who holds himself out, a group that holds itself out uh, from what Keith Preston was talking about uh, this morning. That is the system of produce and consume. Uh, anyone who thinks there's more to life than producing and consuming, than being an economic animal, uh, is a threat uh, to the American paradigm. Uh, and they all threats, all holdouts, must be crushed and assimilated into the system. A lesson we learned from this, which the, the Southerners did not learn, did not understand when this attack came upon us, is that it is only when you abjure the realm that you can be part of a solution uh, to our people's problems and be part of its future as well as its past. In medieval England, you could abjure the realm. You could formally swear off allegiance to the king and, and leave the country. What is necessary in America for white Southerners and as well as for people in this room, I think most of us have achieved this, is that we must psychologically abjure the realm. We must swear it off and we must step outside the regime and the system's paradigm. And it's a great thing to be free of delusions. I, I think that parting with a delusion is more important and liberating than embracing a truth. To be shed of a delusion uh, is a liberating thing. It brings wisdom and opportunity.